to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in john 10 verse 10 jesus said i came that you may have life and have it more abundantly today we're going to be considering what are the greatest things of the christian life we hope that you'll stay tuned as we think about this motivational lesson on the great privileges of the christian life Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. The greatest privilege of the Christian life is to be called sons and daughters of Almighty God. To be adopted into the family of the God of heaven is the greatest privilege we could ever have. In fact, the scripture says in 1 John chapter 3 verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we can be called children of God and this we are. Look at the love that God has exhibited toward mankind. When we were separated by sin, God sent His Son to this world and through His love and through the sacrifice of Christ, we can now be called sons of God. And not only sons, but heirs of all that belongs to God. For as many of us as were baptized into Christ, we've clothed ourselves with Christ and we've become heirs of the things that are God's. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. But you know, when you think about the great privilege of being called sons of God, you know, it's such a great privilege because then we really can look up to heaven as Jesus, Jesus taught us and pray, Our Father who art in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9. But you know, as you think about the great privilege of being sons of God, that means we must also be children of God to be heirs of God. Romans 8 verses 16 to 17 clearly teaches us that if we are children, then we're heirs of God and heirs, joint heirs with Christ. Galatians chapter 4 verse number 4 says that we have been adopted into the family of God in the fullness of time. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. What a privilege it is that though we were separated from God, though we were wandering aimlessly in sin, God was willing through His Son to adopt me and to adopt you into His family. And so the greatest privilege a man could ever have is to look up to heaven and say, Our Father, who art in heaven. 
Let's think about another great principle of the Christian life, and this is the greatest joy. What is the greatest joy in life? Friend, there's no greater joy in life than the joy of salvation. Do you remember the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch? Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling down the road. He teaches him about Christ. He learns what he's got to do to be saved. He obeys the gospel. He comes up out of the water. And the Bible says that Ethiopian eunuch, who we know nothing else about, went on his way rejoicing. Why was that man so happy? Because he had learned the gospel. Because all his sins have been washed away. Because now he has a purpose and something to look forward to. A home in heaven with Almighty God. David prayed in Psalm 51 verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. 1 Peter 1 verse 8, It is that joy that we as Christians look forward to and we build upon in our faith. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. What makes Christianity such a great joy? On that, that great day, that judgment day, as a child of God, I can hear the words, and you can hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. Our joy is based on the fact that we can enter into the fullness of God's joy and His love in the eternal realm by following the teaching of Christ. You see, as a Christian, salvation is found in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. The Bible says that we have all spiritual blessings in Christ. No wonder then the Apostle Paul would later say to the church in Philippi, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Friend, I hope you listen real carefully. There are a lot of things in this life that may give one a sense of passing pleasure, maybe even a sense of passing happiness. But friend, you will never find true, lasting, eternal joy outside of Christ. He is our joy. He's our hope. He's our peace. Everything that we have uh, is in Him, and without that, there's no real happiness or joy in this life. Then I want us to think about another great aspect of the Christian life, and it's this, the greatest fellowship, joining together in communion that Christians have in this life is with Christ and other Christians. Now, to fully understand this, we've got to realize that before Christ, we weren't in communion with God or Christ. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, that our sins had separated us from Almighty God. We had been severed from Christ, Galatians 5 verse 4, by sin. And we had no brotherhood or fellowship outside of this world which is passing away. And yet the Bible says of those who obeyed the gospel in Acts chapter 2, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Acts 2 verse 42. We have that, that joint effort, that communion, that closeness with Christ and other Christians. And friend, that's an encouragement because we know we're not in it alone. We know God is indeed on our side. We know that Christ is our Lord and Savior. Acts 2 verse 36. And if we trust in God, we can overcome the things of this world. You see, the Bible teaches us, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, this world and all that is evil of it. That's not where I'm to place my effort and my emphasis. Rather, I'm to have that joint fellowship with God and other Christians. You see, this world, so many people, I hope you listen carefully, so many people are in fellowship with a world that is passing away, a world that is against God, and a world that doesn't look on the eternal principles that Christians desperately need to. Do not love the world or the things of the world. For all that is in the world, lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it's of the wicked one. And the world and all that's in it is passing away. But he who does the will of God 
That's the man who will endure forever. And so instead of having our fellowship, our closeness, a relationship with the world, we want to be in closeness with God and naturally with other Christians. Listen to this verse, one of the most beautiful in all the New Testament. If, here's the condition, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. That fellowship not only looks up and goes up to heaven itself with God and Christ, but it laterally is with other Christians who are trying to walk in the light and live as God wants us to live. And so greatest fellowship, having a joint communion with Christ and other Christians. Well, what then is the greatest work in this life? There is work to be done, and a lot of people get caught up in work. In fact, in my life and in yours, we spend a lot of time on the job and at work. But what's the greatest work in all the world? For in the greatest vocation or work in all the world is the Christian work, that is, a life of service to God and to others. You know, when you think about serving God, and you think about the things that are really important, I'm reminded of that question that the lawyer asked Jesus in Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 30. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of all? Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, like unto it is, love your neighbor as yourself. What's the greatest work that a person could ever do? Working in the kingdom of God. Seeking first the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, being busy about the Father's business. Jesus in Luke chapter 2, about verses 49 through 52, was questioned by His parents. Why did you leave the caravan? Why did you go and do these things? And, and He was in the temple listening and hearing what they were saying. And so when they questioned Jesus, why did you do this? His response was, Did you not know I must be about my Father's business? Friend, that's what we're here to do. Our work that we need to put the most emphasis and interest upon is working for Almighty God. And you know, the things that we do for God, that's what's really going to count in this life. Do you remember Paul's words to the church in Corinth? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 58, the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian Christians, Be steadfast, immovable. Listen to this always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Not only am I to be abounding in God's work, to be fruitful in it, but when I think about the work of God, I know that labor is not in vain. What's that mean? The things I do for God and for Christ and to serve others in this life, those are the things that are really important and really of esteemed principle importance in my life and yours. Think about Jesus' words in Mark chapter 10, verse number 45. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. Now, friend, I just want you to think about your life. Let's think about our own lives for just a moment and, and all the work, all the effort, all the toil, and all the labor that we do. How much of that is for God? How much work are we really doing in the kingdom for the cause of Christ and to promote God and the gospel? You know, Christians sing the beautiful hymn, I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day. We sing that. We believe that. But are we really doing that every day in our Christian life? Let's then think about another great thing about the Christian life. And we ask this, what's the greatest knowledge that a person could have in this life? And friend, the answer is the greatest knowledge in life is to know God and His Son, Jesus Christ. In fact, did you know, listen very carefully, did you know that knowing God is what eternal life is all about. You know, we think about eternal life, we think the idea of just living forever. That's not the real essence of eternal life. Jesus said in John 17, 3, as He looked up to heaven and prayed to the Father, He said, this is eternal life. What? That they may know you, the true and living God. What's, what's the greatest knowledge? To know God and to be known by Him. Jesus emphasized the power of knowing the truth when he said in John 8, verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. 
I know, Paul said, whom I've believed in and am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him until that day. On the very last day, when we stand before God, we can have confidence knowing that our faith has been placed in something that's sure and solid and will not fade away. I want you to think for just a moment about Jesus' words in John chapter 14, verse number 6. As Thomas said to the Lord, Jesus had just told them, I'm about to go away. Where I'm going, you cannot come at this time. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way in essence? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the way. Without Him, there's no going. Jesus is the truth. Without Him, there's no knowing. Jesus is the life. Without Him, there's no living. Do you see the greatest things of this life include knowing God and knowing His Son, Jesus Christ? But friend, as we talk about knowing God and knowledge of Him, it, it isn't enough just to say, well, I know the facts. Knowing involves keeping God's commands and being approved by God by the life that we live. You know, when we, we say we know someone, it creates the idea of a relationship. It creates the idea of some kind of a communion and fellowship involved in that. And the same is true of God and Christ. If I'm to know God, it requires more than just the facts. It requires me to submit to and obey the will of God. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21. Jesus said, It's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Friend, it is essential that more than just paying lip service to Christ, I obey Him. Jesus said to the Jewish elite in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? And in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, the Scripture affirms the idea that if we're going to obey Christ, if we're going to follow Christ, we must obey Him. He is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. And so I must walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ every day to say that I really know Him. Well, let's think about another great thing about the Christian life. As we think about motivational, encouraging ideas from the Christian life, let's realize the greatest victory in life is to overcome self and this old world. Friend, the struggles that I face and the struggles that you face often deal with self and often deal with the temptations of this world. Do we realize that in Christ we can overcome and be victorious even over self and this world? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. This was even a, a challenge for Paul. But Paul, through his obedience to Christ, could overcome that. And friend, the same is true for us. We might at times say like Paul, the very things I, I don't want to do, Sometimes those are the things I do. The very things I do want to do, sometimes those are the very things that go undone. Yes, it's a fight. It's a battle. But in Christ, we can have the greatest victory ever. You know, when I think about that victory, there is a key to that victory. And it's found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. This is the victory we have, even our faith. What's that mean? When I, th when I think about having the victory, when I think about overcoming self, overcoming sin, overcoming this world, it all happens based on my faith and my trust in God. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, then my faith in Christ, trusting Him implicitly, will help me to win the battle and be victorious. Thus we can say, as Paul so beautifully elaborated, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as a Christian, friend, you've got the greatest victory in all the world. Let's then think about another item that is so encouraging about the Christian life, and that is the greatest gift. What's the greatest gift in this life? Well, you can probably imagine the greatest gift ever given was given by God. The greatest gift in this life is to give oneself unto God 
and of course to others. Now we see that in the prime example of our Lord and Savior. You remember the passage very well. John 3 verse 16, Jesus said, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Friend, when I think about the greatest gift, I think about God giving His Son for mankind and for others so that they could be saved. And as I think about the, the practical aspects of that, the greatest gift in this life is to give oneself to God and to others. Remember the words of Jesus recorded only in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. The Lord said, It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. You know, we can all understand that. It makes you feel better. Rather, maybe then at a time of giving, for you to receive a lot of gifts, the more you mature and the more you grow, it makes you feel better to give, to do good to others, to help out, and especially as it relates to the cause of Christ. In fact, of the Macedonians, it was clearly said in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 5, that they first gave themselves unto the Lord. Here's a group of people who, before they put the first dollar in the collection plate, made up their mind. The greatest gift ever is not what we put in monetarily, but giving ourselves unto God. Jesus said, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will men put back into your bosom. Luke chapter 6, verse number 38. And so, let's think about sacrifice. Let's think about giving. Let's not look... So we live in a me generation. But that me generation will never make us happy. Giving to God and giving to others and serving them... That's the greatest gift that a person could ever have in this life. And so when we think about great things, how important indeed that is. But friend, as we think about great things, it's also important for us to emphasize the greatest loss in this life would be one's soul. Oh, there are great things about Christianity, but friend, let's realize that it would be horrible. It would be a tragedy. It would be the greatest loss ever if one were to lose his soul. Do you remember the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37? Jesus asked two rhetorical questions. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? My soul and your soul is the most important thing ever. And friend, to lose that to put selfishness, to put worldly interest, to let the devil into my life and have his way with it, that would be the greatest, most horrible loss you could ever imagine. Let me give you an illustration. Luke chapter 12, about verses 15 through 21. There was a man there who had a, a great harvest, great crop year we might say, so much so that he said to himself, so you've got many goods, laid it for many years, take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. In essence, he said, I'll, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. That he did. Do you know what thing he left out? Jesus said to that man, you fool, this night will your soul be required of you. Then whose things will those be whom you have acquired? So is he who is rich but not toward God. Friend, the greatest loss, the absolute most horrible, devastating loss ever is the loss of someone's soul. Now I hope you'll listen real carefully to these words. Each of us possess a soul. That soul is going to live somewhere forever. Now is the time that I have opportunity and the ability to do something about it. If I squander that time, if I, if I, I don't take action, if I ignore it, if I say to myself, I'll deal with it later, and the chance and opportunity never came, can you imagine what a horrible, horrible loss that would be? Think about it this way. Let's say that you said to yourself, I, I've heard the gospel. I believe in the gospel. I want to become a Christian. And one day in the near future, I'm going to do that. And you, you said to yourself, and you even made a promise, I'm going to become a Christian one day. And before that day came, your life was snuffed out. Can you imagine a greater loss in all the world than that? Your soul and my soul is the most important thing that we have in this life. But then along those same lines, I want us to think about one of the greatest neglects in this life, and that is the neglect 
of salvation. Listen to Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You know, all of us from time to time are, are prone to neglect things. Maybe we neglect our chores. Maybe you neglect mowing the yard because it's hot outside. Maybe you neglect doing some chores in the house. Maybe you even neglect doing a few things at work. And, and we could probably skate by with neglecting those things if we're careful. But if you neglect salvation, you have neglected something that is of eternal importance. And listen again to that question. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If I fail to take advantage of salvation... It's the greatest neglect in all the world. But friend, we want to close on a positive note by noting this. Of all the great things that we might find in Scripture, the one great question that rises above all else is found in Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. The Philippian jailer asked of Paul, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Friend, there's no greater question in all the world than that. And Paul gave him that answer, and we find it throughout the book of Acts. On the day of Pentecost, when they realized they'd killed their own Messiah, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. To those who heard the message about Jesus and believed it. John 8 verse 24. If they were then willing to change their life and repent, turn from sin to God. Acts 3 verse 19. Having acknowledged Jesus as Lord and Savior with the mouth. Acts chapter 8 verse 36 and 39. Those who did that were baptized in water, immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins. Friend, we ask you today, have you really taken advantage of the great things of Christianity? There's no greater life, no greater joy, and yet at the same time, no greater neglect than neglect of salvation. If you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, we're encouraging you today, be a Christian, obey the gospel, enjoy the great life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.